section twenty four of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty four the guru no longer travelled with the imperial army but proceeded to kanetch in the eastern part of what is now the lutiana district there one fata came to pay him his respects and ask if he could do him any service the guru asked for his best mare to aid him in his escape fata who had not been sincere in his protestations of friendship put him off with excuses it is said that when he left the guru and went home he found the mare had died of snake-bite this was understood to be the result of his hypocrisy and churlishness to the guru the guru thence proceeded to hehar also in the ludhiana district where lived kripal the udasi mahant who had so distinguished himself in the battle of bangani the guru on meeting him dismissed ghani khan and nabi khan after giving them presents and a letter recommending them to the consideration of the faithful though kripal had been previously so devoted to the guru he now feared to entertain him lest the mohammedans should be informed that he was sheltering an outlaw he accordingly advised the guru to move on towards the villages of lama and jatpura on the way thither the guru met a mohammedan called kala a rich and important person who was chaudhry of chagrayan and raikot two considerable towns of the ludhiana district kalha entertained him at jatpura the guru requested him to send a messenger to sarhind to inquire the fate of his mother and his two youngest sons the guru remained at jatpura until the messenger's return jatpur is about fifty miles distant from sarhind this distance the messenger is said to have traversed in an incredibly short space of time the following is the messenger's story one of the most painful in history it has been already stated that the guru's mother entrusted herself and the two grandsons who accompanied her to a brahman he with sweet words took them to his house and induced them to put faith in him when the guru's mother went to sleep he stole her money which she carried in a saddle-bag and buried it he then went to her and told her there were several thieves prowling about the neighbourhood and she must be careful of her valuables he said he gave her this information so that she might not afterwards blame him she called her servant and told him what she had heard he almost immediately afterwards informed her that her saddle-bag was missing as no one had entered the house but the ladies party and the brahman she interrogated the latter on the subject he pretended to be furious at suspicion having been directed against him and said that that was the result of doing good and of entertaining homeless wayfarers and outlaws he had saved the guru's mother and children from death and the return they made him for his trouble and hospitality was to charge him with theft as if he were a vulgar malefactor then saying that he could not trust her and her children he ordered them to leave his house the brahman with loud cries proceeded to the chaudhry or chief civil official of kheri and informed him that the guru's mother and sons had just come to his house and both he and the chaudhry would obtain a large reward for delivering them to the imperial authorities the brahman and the chaudhry then went to the next highest official arangar the governor of marinda he proceeded with them to the brahman's house and thence they took the guru's mother and her two grandsons to wazir khan viceroy of sarhind he ordered them to be confined in a tower people thronged next day to see them and cursed and abused the treacherous brahman to their heart's content wazir khan ordered the children to be brought before him when the guru's mother heard the order it stung her like a sharp arrow 
one sokunan khatri who had vainly sued for one of the guru's sons as a husband for his daughter now came forward and said the children were certainly the progeny of the serpent that is sons of the guru and that when they grew up they would be as destructive as their father the governor of Marinda told mata gujari in order to pacify her that he would send the children back after showing them to wazir khan not believing him she put one of them at each side of her and tried to conceal them with her dress the guru's son jajjar singh on hearing the rangar's voice stood up and said to his grandmother the turks have ever been our enemies how can we escape from them therefore let us go to the viceroy saying this he took his younger brother fatah singh and went with the rangar when they reached the viceroy's court the rangar in order to add to their sufferings told them that their father their two eldest brothers and their companions had all been killed in chamkaur he added your only hope of escape now is to bow before the viceroy and accept islam and perhaps he will spare your lives jajjar singh when confronted with the viceroy thus addressed him my father the holy guru gobind singh is not dead who can kill him he is protected by the immortal god if any one say that he can tear down heaven how is that possible were a storm to attempt to drive a mountain before it could it ever do so were any one to try to grasp the sun and moon it would be a feat impossible to accomplish were the guru to desire it he could destroy every trace of you but he deemeth it his first duty to obey the laws of heaven when we have dedicated our heads to our father who is such a guru why should we bow them before a false and deceitful sinner on hearing this the people all cried out that the children ought to be allowed to go unharmed the misnamed sukhanan now interposed and repeated that these were the offspring of a cobra and from their heads to their feet filled with venom see my friends he said they have not the least fear and are so proud that they even insult and defy the viceroy wazir khan then reflected that if the children became mohammedans it would be a gain and glory to his faith he told them that if they would accept his faith he would grant them an estate marry them to the daughters of chiefs and they would become happy and be honoured by the emperor jujhar singh then looking at his younger brother said my brother the time to sacrifice our lives as our grandfather guru teg bahadur did hath now arrived what thinkest thou fatah singh replied brother dear our grandfather parted with his head but not with his religion and he ordered us to follow his example now that we have received the baptism of the spirit and the sword what care we for death wherefore it is best that we should give our lives and thus save the sikh religion and bring down god's vengeance on the turks jujhar singh again spoke on the same subject my brother our grandfather guru teg bahadur spurned the mohammedan religion here is this noble family of ours a man like guru gobind singh our father a man like guru teg bahadur our grandfather a man like guru har gobind our great-grandfather we who are their descendants cannot attach a stigma to their memories the young boy waxing still more angry continued here o viceroy i spurn thy religion and will not part with mine own it hath become the custom of our family to forfeit life rather than faith o fool why seekest thou to tempt us with worldly ambition we will never be led astray by the false advantages thou offerest the indignities inflicted by the turks on our grandfather shall be the fire to consume them and our deaths the wind to fan the flame in this way we shall destroy the turks without forfeiting our holy faith the mohammedan viceroy could not endure outspokenness of this description and in the words of the chronicler began to burn like sand in a fiery furnace he said he must put the children to death they had no fear of any one and their words were liable to cause disaffection and religious apathy in others sukhanand was ready to support the viceroy and suggested additional reasons for putting the children to death 
he said they had spoken insolently before the viceroy and when they grew up they would follow their father's example and destroy armies what good could be expected from them they would be always exciting revolts they were prisoners with no right of pardon and if they were released no one knew what they would do there were no means for their repression but death then out spoke the nawab of malar Katla, o viceroy these children are still drinking milk in the nursery and are too young to commit an offence they know not good from evil wherefore be pleased to allow them to depart this representation the viceroy heeded not but cast about for some one to kill the children his servants who were present said they were willing to sacrifice their lives for him but they were not executioners he turned to right and left but all his staff hung down their heads in token of refusal and pity for the children at last looking behind him he espied a gilzai who with the cruelty of his race offered to do the sanguinary deed it is a general belief among the sikhs that the children were bricked into a wall and suffered to die in that position but the authors of the suraj parkash and of the gur bilas both state that the children were put to death in the order of their ages by the sword of the gilzai executioner they vied with each other as to who should first have the honour of martyrdom the two children jujar singh and fatah singh aged nine and seven years respectively perished on the thirteenth of po sambat seventeen sixty two a d seventeen hundred and five a rich sikh called todar mal as soon as he heard of the imprisonment of the guru's children hastened to the viceroy with the intention of ransoming them but arrived too late the children had already been put to death he then proceeded to the guru's mother mata gujari who had not yet heard of the execution of her grandchildren but was at the same time suffering extreme mental agony she every now and then would pray to the gurus to protect her little ones o guru nanak may no hair of my grandchildren's heads be touched o my son guru gobind singh pardon my sins and protect me now woe is me i know not what may happen to my grandchildren to-day todar mal sought to break the sad intelligence to her but his voice was stifled in his throat on seeing this mata gujari became extremely alarmed and standing up at once said tell me the truth why art thou sorrowful when will they allow my grandsons to return and what questions have they put them todar mal then strengthening his resolve addressed her i have made my heart harder than a stone and come to tell thee of the death of thy grandchildren o mother the light of thine eyes the support of the world the life of the sikhs the darlings of the guru have been to-day massacred by the turks on receiving this news mata gujari was struck down as if a mountain had fallen on her todar mal began to fan her in her swoon with the skirt of his dress on recovering consciousness to some extent she began to call upon her grandsons o jujar singh o fatah singh after such love for me whither have you gone take me with you who will call now me mother or grandmother who will come and sit on my lap how shall i now behold you o youthful warriors light of my courtyard son of my family i know not what your sufferings must have been to-day o oh, my grandchildren on whom i have never turned my back even when asleep to-day alas alas the mohammedan tyrants have killed you the darlings of mine eyes my beautiful ones i concealed my grandsons from the gaze of others and behold what hath happened to-day what have i done to you o children that you should have abandoned me to misery saying this she fell heavily to the ground and gave up her spirit todar mal cremated the bodies of the guru's mother and her grandchildren and buried their ashes a sikh temple now called fatah gar was subsequently erected on the spot when the turks heard that the brahman who had betrayed the guru's mother and children possessed much wealth they arrested him and all his family and forced him by torture to tell where he had concealed his treasure he pointed out the spot where he had buried mata gujari's money but it was not found there 
the turks believing that he was only deceiving them continued to torture him until his soul took flight to the infernal regions while the guru was listening to the narrative he was digging up a shrub with his knife he said as i dig up this shrub by the roots so shall the turks be extirpated he inquired if any one except the nawab of malar kotla had spoken on behalf of the children the messenger replied in the negative the guru then said that after the roots of the oppressive turks were all dug up the roots of the nawab should still remain his sikhs should one day come and lay sarhind waste before the guru had set out from jatpur he presented his host kala with a sword to preserve in memory of him he was to honour it with incense and flowers as long as he did so he and his family should flourish but if ever he wore it he should lose his possessions kala during his lifetime treated the sword according to the guru's injunctions and so did his son after him but his grandson put on the weapon and employed it in the chase in endeavouring to kill a deer with it he struck his own thigh and died of the wound the author of the surab parkash wrote that this incident actually occurred when he was a boy and he still remembered it End of chapter twenty four section twenty five of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty five the guru continued his retreat from the turks and proceeded on his litter from jatpur to dina on the way he met a sikh who presented him with a horse and saddle on arriving at dina the guru met shamira lakmira and takmal grandsons of jad rai who had rendered material assistance to guru har gobind in the battle of gurusar jad rai's family at first lived at kangar his grandsons had now left that village and gone to dina the guru represented to the young men that they incurred danger in entertaining him but they felt no apprehension and gave him hospitable treatment while there the guru gathered some fighting men to his standard during the guru's stay at dina he was visited by parm singh and dharm singh descendants of bhai rupa of whom mention has been made in the life of the sixth guru parm singh and dharm singh made the guru an offering of a horse and a dress the guru took special notice of shamira and gave him the horse and the dress which parm singh and dharm singh had presented him the guru told shamira that he should own land as far as he could course his steed shamira mentioned this in his household his maternal uncle laughed at the guru's promise and said that if the guru had been able to work miracles he would not now be a fugitive shamira was partially convinced by this argument and merely coursed his steed round his own village as the result of his want of faith he only remained in possession of the land within the circle he thus described the viceroy of sarhind heard that the guru was being entertained by shamira and his brothers in dina he wrote to shamira on the subject and ordered him under pain of his highest displeasure to arrest and surrender the guru shamira replied that he was only entertaining his priest as the viceroy himself or any one else might do the guru was merely visiting his sikhs and molesting no one while sending this reply shamira feared that the viceroy would send troops and arrest the guru so he sent a spy to obtain information of the viceroy's movements and proceedings the viceroy kept troops ready but did not send them immediately meanwhile the guru enlisted several men and prepared for his defence the guru's stay at dina appears to have been somewhat protracted for it was there he wrote his celebrated zafar nama or persian epistle to aurangzeb it begins as usual in such compositions with an invocation to god 
o thou perfect in miracles eternal beneficent bestower of grace maintenance salvation and mercy dispenser of bliss pardoner saviour remitter of sins dear to the heart king of kings bestower of excellence indicator of the way without colour and without equal lord who giveth heavenly bliss to him who hath no property no retinue no army and no comforts distinct from the world powerful whose light is everywhere diffused thou bestowest gifts as if thou wert present in person pure cherisher bestower of favours thou art merciful and provider of sustenance in every land thou art lord of every clime the greatest of the great perfect in beauty merciful master of knowledge support of the unhappy protector of the faith fountain of eloquence searcher of hearts author of revelation appreciator of wisdom lord of intelligence diviner of secrets omnipresent god thou knowest the affairs of the world thou resolvest its difficulties thou art its great organizer address to aurangzeb i have no faith in thine oath to which thou tookest the one god as witness i have not a particle of confidence in thee thy treasurer and thy ministers are all false he who putteth faith in thine oath on the koran is thereby a ruined man the insolent crow cannot touch him who hath fallen under the shadow of the puma he who taketh the protection of a powerful tiger cannot be approached by a goat a buffalo or a deer had i even secretly sworn on the volume of my choice faith to accept thy religion i should not have had to withdraw my infantry and cavalry from anandpur as to my defeat at chamkaur what could forty men do when a hundred thousand came on them unawares the oath-breakers attacked them abruptly with swords arrows and muskets i was constrained to engage in the combat and i fought to the utmost of my ability when an affair passeth beyond the region of diplomacy it is lawful to have recourse to the sword had i been able to repose confidence in thine oath on the koran i would not have abandoned my city had i not known that thou wert crafty and deceitful as a fox i would never on any account have come hither he who cometh to me and sweareth on the koran ought not to kill or imprison me thine army came clothed like blue bottles and all of a sudden charged with a loud shout every soldier of thine who advanced beyond his defences to attack my position fell deluged in blood thy troops who had committed no aggression received no injury at our hands when i saw that nahar khan entered the fight i quickly gave him the taste of my arrow many soldiers who came with him and boasted of their prowess ignominiously deserted the field of battle another afghan officer advanced like a rushing flood an arrow or a musket ball he made many assaults received many wounds and at last while in the act of killing two of my sikhs was killed himself khwaja mardud remained behind a wall and came not forth like a man had i but seen his face i would certainly have bestowed an error on him too at last many were killed on both sides by showers of arrows and bullets and the earth became red as a rose heads and legs lay in heaps as if the field were covered with balls and hockey sticks the whizzing of arrows the twanging of bows and a universal hubbub reached the sky men the bravest of the brave fought like madmen but how could forty even of the bravest succeed when opposed by a countless host when the lamp of day was veiled the queen of night came forth in all her splendour and god who protected me showed me the way to escape from mine enemies there was not a hair of my head touched nor did i in any way suffer did i not know that thou o faithless man wert a worshipper of wealth and perjurer thou keepest no faith and observest no religion thou knowest not god and believest not in mohammed he who hath regard for his religion never swerveth from his promise thou hast no idea of what an oath on the koran is and canst have no belief in divine providence wert thou to take a hundred oaths on the koran i would not even then trust thee in the slightest hadst thou any intention of keeping thine oath thou wouldst have girded up thy loins and come to me 
when thou didst swear by muhammad and call the word of god to witness it was incumbent on thee to observe that oath were the prophet himself present here i would make it my special object to inform him of thy treachery do what is incumbent on thee and adhere to thy written promise thou shouldst have cheerfully fulfilled it and also the verbal promises of thine envoy everybody ought to be a man of his word and not utter one thing while he meditateth another thou didst promise to abide by the words of thy kazi if thou hast spoken truly then come to me if thou desire to seal thy promise on the koran i would gladly send it to thee for the purpose if thou come to the village of kangar we shall have an interview thou shalt not run the slightest danger on the way for the whole tribe of barars are under me come to me that we may speak to each other and that i may utter kind words to thee i am a slave and servant of the king of kings and ready to obey his order with my life should his order reach me i will go to thee with all my heart if thou have any belief in god delay not in this matter it is thy duty to know god he never ordered thee to annoy others thou art seated on an emperor's throne yet how strange are thy justice thine attributes and thy regard for religion alas a hundred times alas for thy sovereignty strange strange is thy decree promises not meant to be fulfilled injure those who make them smite not any one mercilessly with the sword or a sword from on high shall smite thyself o man be not reckless fear god he cannot be flattered or praised the king of kings is without fear he is the true emperor of earth and heaven god is the master of both worlds he is the creator of all animals from the feeble ant to the powerful elephant he is the protector of the miserable and destroyer of the reckless his name is the support of the unhappy it is he who showeth man the way he ought to go thou art bound by thine oath on the koran bring the matter to a good issue according to thy promises it is incumbent on thee to act wisely and be discreet in all thine actions what though my four sons were killed i remain behind like a coiled snake what bravery is it to quench a few sparks of life thou art merely exciting a raging fire the more how well spoke the sweet-tongued fir dowsi haste is the devil's work i would have gone many times to thee had thy promise been kept when the bullocks were plundered as thou didst forget thy word on that day so will god forget thee god will grant thee the fruit of the evil deed thou didst design it is good to act according to thy religion and to know that god is dearer than life i do not deem thou knowest god since thou hast done acts of oppression wherefore the great god knoweth thee not and will not receive thee with all thy wealth hadst thou sworn a hundred times on the koran i would not have trusted thee in the slightest even for a moment i will not enter thy presence nor travel on the same road with thee but if god so will it i will proceed towards thee fortunate art thou aurangzeb king of kings expert swordsman and writer handsome is thy person and intelligent art thou emperor and ruler of the country thou art clever to administer thy kingdom and skilled to wield the sword thou art generous to thy co-religionists and prompt to crush thine enemies thou art the great dispenser of kingdoms and wealth thy generosity is profuse and in battle thou art firm as a mountain exalted is thy position thy loftiness is as that of the pleiades thou art king of kings and ornament of the thrones of the world thou art monarch of the world but far from thee is religion i wanted to kill the hillmen who were full of strife they worshipped idols and i was an idol breaker behold the power of the good and pure god who by means of one man killed hundreds of thousands what can an enemy do when god the friend is kind his function it is as the great bestower to bestow he giveth deliverance and pointeth out the way to his creatures he teacheth the tongue to utter his praises in the hour of action he blindeth the enemy he rescueth the helpless and protecteth them from injury the merciful showeth mercy to him who acteth honestly god bestoweth peace on him who heartily performeth his service how can an enemy lead astray him with whom the guide of the way is well pleased should tens of thousands proceed against such a person the creator will be his guardian 
when thou lookest to thine army and wealth i look to god's praises thou art proud of thine empire while i am proud of the kingdom of the immortal god be not heedless this caravansary is only for a few days people leave it at all times behold the revolution which passeth over every denizen and house in this faithless world even though thou art strong annoy not the weak lay not the axe to thy kingdom when god is a friend what can an enemy do even though he multiply himself a hundred times if an enemy practise enmity a thousand times he cannot as long as god is a friend injure even a hair of one's head the guru sent the above to the emperor by daya singh and dharm singh who had survived the battle of chamkaur and escaped to dina with the guru they disguised themselves as mohammedan pilgrims and proceeded on their journey to the south of india on reaching dili they took shelter in the sikh temple and received the visits of several admiring sikhs next morning they set out for agra thence they crossed the river chambal and proceeded to ajain whence they crossed the narbada and travelled by burampur to aurangabad thence they proceeded to ahmad nagar where the emperor was encamped there daya singh and dharm singh met a sikh called jetha singh who told them it would be very difficult for them to obtain an audience of the emperor they said it did not matter and asked him to summon all the sikhs who were there to meet them and hear their story daya singh and dharm singh told the sikhs of their mission and read a letter specially addressed to them by the guru End of chapter 25section twenty six of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty six meanwhile the guru was preparing for his defence at dina but in order that the innocent villagers might not suffer from warlike operations directed against him he pitched his tent in the neighbouring forest it would appear that he approached if he did not actually enter the present village of jalal for it is recorded that the inhabitants of that village gave him supplies and a lance for defence they complained that the inhabitants of a neighbouring village bore them enmity there were always affrays between the two villages and the inhabitants of jalal were always worsted the guru told them to obey and believe in him and they should always be victorious they trusted him and obtained several victories subsequently however the inhabitants of jalal forgot their promises to the guru and stole horses belonging to the sikhs the offenders were punished and expelled from their village by those whom they had wronged they subsequently begged the sikhs pardon and were allowed to dwell at gurusar where the guru had encamped the guru thence proceeded to the village of bhagta in the present state of faridkot the village had been called after bhai bhagtu a grandson of bhai bahilo who was a distinguished sikh in the time of guru arjan bhagtu had five sons gurdas tara bara mihra and bhakta they presented a fully caparisoned steed to the guru gurdas and tara are the men we have already described as masands of ram rai by this time they had returned to their native village the guru remained in bhakta for three days and on the fourth travelled to wandar in the present district of firozpur thence he proceeded into a dense forest where he met a nephew of kapura the chaudhry of several villages round kot kapura in the present state of faridkot the nephew complained that his uncle had expelled him he was he said marching to do battle with him but on hearing of the guru's arrival he first went to pay him his respects that being a more holy object than making war on his uncle the guru said that kapura's troops would arrive on the morrow but his nephew must not at present engage in a combat with them his troops would subsequently conquer those of kapura the nephew following the guru's advice decided to remain at home on the morrow 
his wife however on seeing him thus ingloriously inactive asked for his sword and turban offered him her petticoat and said she would go and fight herself this taunt roused her husband to action in disregard of the guru's advice he went to the battle and was killed by his uncle's forces the guru thence proceeded to bahiwal and sarawan and billeted his sikhs on the villages one sikh named maliargar singh was fed by a poor villager on pilan the tiny fruit of the jowl tree he told the guru that he had had an excellent dinner the guru on subsequently discovering that he had dined on pilan and thus received only indifferent food complimented him on his contentment and said that sikhs ought ever to act as he had done and never dispraise food offered them the guru continued if any one come to a sikh and receive not food from him know that that sikh hath sinned if any one beg food from a sikh he too hath sinned because of his greed the guru then visited kot kapura and put up outside the city under a pipal tree which is still pointed out to the traveller it is in a little promontory in the centre of a lake formed by the excavation of earth to build the town kapura came to see him and brought him a fully caparisoned horse and other presents next day kapura again visited him and found him seated on one couch while his weapons were laid before him on another he reverenced arms because he said they who wore them and practised their use became brave and conquered their enemies the guru begged kapura's permission to take shelter in his fort kapura replied that he had no power to withstand the imperial army and no desire to wander a fugitive like the guru the guru then said the muhammadans would take his fort put his head into a bag of ashes and then hang him kapura left in anger and going home closed the gates of the fort so that the guru might not enter by surprise the guru heard that wazir khan's army was now in hot pursuit he accordingly set out from kapura and sought shelter in dilwan a village about four miles to the southeast of it there prithi chand's descendants had been settled for some time one of them called kal now a very old man visited the guru and made him a present of a suit of clothes upon this the guru threw off and burned the greater part of the blue dress which he had been using for disguise in the asa ki war occurs the line neil bastar le capre pahire turk pathani amal kirya the turks and pathans put on blue clothes and reigned for this the guru read neil bastar le capre fare turk pathani amal gaya i have torn the blue clothes which i wore the rule of the turks and pathans is at an end the guru meant the alteration as a curse on the turks and pathans it was deemed an impious act to alter any part of the granth sahib this the guru did not deny but said he hoped that the murder of his father and of his own children and the grievous sufferings of his sikhs were a sufficient atonement a piece of his blue clothes which the guru did not consign to the fire he preserved in memory of his troubles it is said to have subsequently suggested the blue dress of the akalis or nihangs the guru soon left dilwan and pitched his tent in a forest between maluka and kotha thence he proceeded to jaito in the present state of naba there kapura arrived on a hunting excursion he complained of perturbation of mind on account of the curse the guru had uttered the guru however refused to retract his words on the contrary he said that kapura should ever remain a puppy of the muhammadans and have great suffering in consequence while the guru was in this locality a messenger arrived with the news that wazir khan's army was marching hither and would arrive in a few days the guru asked kapura for a guide kapura sent an officer called khana and some troopers with instructions to show him the way as far as kidrana but not engage in any combat and if possible hinder the guru from doing so next morning the guru escaped to ramiana in the varikot state on the way he found a man gathering the fruit of the wild caper 
the guru tasted but not relishing it told the man to throw it away the man would not do so altogether the guru said it had been his intention to banish drought from that part of the country but now he could not do so owing to the man's obstinacy and disregard of his orders from ramiana the guru proceeded towards kidrana all the contests and sufferings of the guru became known in the manja and the sikhs who dwelt there censured themselves for having listened to duni chand and abandoned the guru at anandpur they now began to consider how they could make reparation and assist their spiritual master in his dire extremity they were however of the opinion of the sikhs of lahore that the guru should adopt the way of baba nanak and cease all hostilities they sent a large deputation to press their advice on him and promised that if he accepted it they would use influence with the emperor to pardon him otherwise they would not consider themselves his sikhs or him their guru the guru on the way to kidrana arrived at a village owned by a khatri called rupa who warned him off through fear of the emperor's displeasure the guru had a barar named dan singh as his clerk and chamberlain dan singh's son saw the enemy approaching and duly informed the guru the guru took no notice but continued to walk his horse the warning was repeated but the guru heeded it not the youth then struck the guru's horse with the object of quickening his pace at this the guru became angry and uttered words of censure don singh interceded for his son the guru replied that he treated don singh's son as his own and a father's censure would not affect his children the guru instanced the case of a tigress removing her cubs from a burning forest when she takes them in her mouth every one thinks she is going to devour them but this is not so her act is prompted by love the deputation of the manja sikhs found the guru after much search on hearing their representation he said if you were my sikhs you would receive and not give me instruction i do not require you you deserted me formerly who hath sent for you now you have come to adjust my quarrels but where were you when i needed your assistance you used no influence with the emperor when guru arjan was tortured to death or when guru teg bahadur was beheaded on this account my brethren i cannot listen to your advice when i am again in difficulty you will betray me as before put on record that you renounce me and go to your homes upon this the deputation drew up a formal document to the effect that they renounced the guru unless he ceased to contend with the turks a sikh who had been put on a tree to keep watch said i see the enemy approaching and they will soon see us the guru took up his bow and arrows and mounted his horse he was advised by kapoor's guide to go to kidrana where there was water of which he could hold possession and where the mohammedans if they ventured thither would die of thirst the guru said there is dust in the eyes of the mohammedans and earth in their mouths they may stare as much as they please but when i remember the holy baba nanak they cannot see me five of the manja sikhs repented of their renunciation of the guru and decided to return and render him all assistance they induced thirty-five more of their number to return with them the guru thus obtained an unexpected reinforcement of forty good and earnest fighting men they were joined by a heroine named bago who through zeal for the sikh cause had donned man's attire and vowed to suffer death if necessary on the blood-stained field of danger on behalf of the guru the guru and his personal guard preceded them to kidrana in the present firozpur district of the punjab but on finding no water there the tank having run dry moved on into the neighbouring forest where they deemed they should be in greater safety and whence they could more easily escape if overpowered the forty men of the manja on arriving at kidrana decided to cover the trees in the neighbourhood with clothes so that the enemy might think they were encamped in great numbers and not make a sudden attack on them kapoor appeared in the enemy's ranks he overtly came to show them the way by which he had instructed his officer to take the guru and his forty sikhs to their destruction 
wazir khan ordered his army to charge the sikhs who stood to oppose him and in whose ranks he believed the guru to be concealed they received the charge with the utmost bravery the muhammadans were giving way when wazir khan rallied them by asking if they were not ashamed to fly before such a handful of men five sikhs who advanced to the front were riddled with bullets ten more advanced to the imperial army and cleared the field wherever they went when they were cut down the enemy took courage and advanced nearer the remaining sikhs eleven sikhs then rushed on the enemy and smote them down they were however unable to cope with superior numbers and fell under the swords of the muhammadans the woman bago fought heroically in their ranks disposed of several of her muhammadan opponents and transmitted her name as an indian heroine for the admiration of future generations the guru and his bodyguard had taken up their position on a sand hill about two miles distant he discharged arrows from their with fatal effect against the muhammadans who could not see from what quarter destruction was raining on them at the conclusion of the engagement wazir khan thought the guru was killed and ordered his men to search for his body the tank at kidrana as already stated having become dry wazir khan's army was in great straits for want of water kapoor told him that it could only be obtained at a distance of thirty miles in front and ten miles in rear and advised him to march back and save the lives of his men and horses otherwise they would all perish to such distress was the muhammadan army reduced that they abandoned their dead and wounded and relinquished their search for the body of the guru wazir khan boasted that he had killed him and that the emperor on hearing the joyful intelligence would greatly honour and reward him on finding that the muhammadan army had departed the guru went to see the battlefield relieved the wounded and performed the obsequies of the slain he went about wiping the faces of both dead and wounded and extolling their unsurpassed valour copious tears flowed from his eyes he said the dead had given up their lives for him and they should abide in bliss in the guru's paradise he found mahan singh breathing heavily and desiring a last sight of his spiritual master the guru told him to open his eyes and when he did so his strength returned the guru invited him to ask for any boon he desired from empire to salvation mahan singh thought it was best to ask for the cancellation of the deed of renunciation of the guru drawn up by the manja sikhs the guru at first refused but on being pressed consented to cancel it he drew the document from his pocket and destroyed it mahan singh then breathed his last the guru ordered the Bararars he had recently enlisted to collect the slain and cremate them he promised that all sikhs who visited the place on the first of magh the anniversary of the battle should become filled with the martial spirit of their sires kadrana has since that time been called muktsar or the tank of salvation because those who fell on that spot were no more subject to transmigration in the process of collecting the slain it was found that another person showed signs of life this was the heroine bhago the guru addressed her taking off thy woman's dress thou didst come to me with the manja sikhs it is well that thou hast fought here blessings on thy life arise and come with me she detailed the story of her departure from her home in the company of the sikhs of the manja and then continued i obtained possession of a strong spear when all the sikhs were dead the turks advanced on me i spitted several of them others directed their weapons against me but thou didst extend thine arm to save me now that i have seen thee i am happy and have no further desire than to abide with thee End of chapter twenty six section twenty seven of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty seven the guru thence proceeded to saran and thence to nutheha the inhabitants of the latter village prayed him to leave them he then went to tahlian fatah saman a village about twenty miles south-west of Muktsar where he was welcomed some sikhs from hariki came to him with an offering of a lungi and a kahes the guru put the kahes on his shoulders and tied the lungi round his loins 
man singh remonstrated and reminded him of his own prohibition of the wearing of a lungi in this fashion and said he was liable to a fine the guru replied i am dressed according to the custom of the country jeha des teha the hais ter lungi madhe kahais every country hath its own dress a lungi for the loins and a kahes shawl for the shoulders the guru feeling his insecurity asked that a guard should be provided for him the warlike sikhs put some dogars on guard the guru intended to reward the hariki sikhs had they kept guard themselves as it was he blessed the dogars and foretold that they should have possession of all the adjacent river banks the prophecy has been fulfilled and there their descendants have since remained next day the guru continued his journey and rested under a bur tree where he passed the night the following day he proceeded to wajidpur some six or seven miles to the east of firazpur the inhabitants told him that the emperor's drums were often heard there and they suggested to him to depart the guru said that instead of the drums of the emperor the praises of the sikhs should subsequently resound in the locality the place afterwards fell into the possession of the kanhaya misal while in this neighbourhood the guru heard the cry of a partridge and pursued it the partridge gave chase and tired out men and horses at last the guru caught it plucked it and threw it before his hawk which after some hesitation began to devour it the guru when asked the cause of this strange proceeding told the following anecdote in a previous birth the partridge had been an agriculturist and the hawk a money-lender the agriculturist had borrowed from the money-lender squandered the money and then went to live in another village the money-lender followed him and insisted on payment the, the agriculturist begged for time and promised to discharge the debt the money-lender demanded a surety the agriculturist said he had no surety but the guru the money-lender was then satisfied and went home the agriculturist however ultimately failed to pay the money both died soon after upon which the agriculturist became this partridge and the money-lender my hawk the hawk at first refused to touch the partridge as the latter had given me as surety i have now fulfilled my surety ship by bestowing the partridge on the hawk if any one give me again as surety and discharge not his debt i will treat him as the hawk hath done the partridge the guru left wajidpur and returned to muksar thence he proceeded to rupana and thence to bahundar garusar and tehri after that he proceeded to kaljaharani thence he marched to chahatiana and on his way passed through several minor villages in chahatiana some of his soldiers clamoured for their pay and said they would not allow him to proceed further until he had paid them their arrears he offered them their choice of remaining his sikhs or of taking their pay and returning to their homes they elected to take their pay and dismissal at this juncture a sikh opportunely arrived with a large pecuniary offering for the guru he summoned his soldiers and gave them their pay at the rate of eight annas per day for cavalry and four annas per day for infantry to don singh their officer the guru offered his pay but he refused to take it and elected to share the guru's fortunes the guru complimented him on laying the foundation stone of the sikh religion in malwa as mahan singh had done in the manjaha his troops were meditating how they could extort more money from the guru they told him he had offered them the alternative of taking their pay or becoming sikhs as they had accepted the former they were now excluded from sikhism they asked for double pay partly to compensate them for their religious disability and partly to support their people at home the guru complied with their demand and that he might not be pestered with further extortionate demands buried the remainder of the money which his pious follower had brought him 
a mohammedan fakir called Bra brahmi ibrahim who lived on a neighbouring mound came to the guru with offerings and asked to be baptized the guru expressed his satisfaction at the proposal thou art the first moslem to be baptized according to my rights if any moslem whether of high or low position and good faith desire to join the khalsa it is proper that he should be baptized and received into our community the mohammedan was accordingly baptized and received the name ajmer singh the guru thence went to the village of sahib chand and thence to kat bahai on his way he baptized several people from there he proceeded to rohila and then to bambuha where he remained nine days thence he returned to bajak when the guru was in the neighbourhood of maluka and kotha one of the sect called dewanas madmen who attempted forcible access to him was cut down by his sentry while the guru was in bajak guda and dewanas spiritual guide sought to avenge the death of his follower and accordingly sent fifty men of his sect to assassinate the guru on learning however that the guru had a strong bodyguard forty-eight of them turned back and only two suku and budha proceeded to the guru they carried no weapons but whiled away their time on the journey with the music of a sarangi on reaching the guru instead of trying to kill him they began to play and sing for him they sang among others the following verses the soul resideth in a frail body parents are not for ever nor doth youth abide we must all march onwards why should man be proud the guru was much pleased with them and they were equally pleased with him to show their satisfaction and the pleasure they felt in his company they took up his bed on their shoulders and carried it for more than a mile the guru gave them a square rupee and told them to preserve it in memory of him and promised that they should obtain whatever their hearts desired the guru then proceeded to jassi baghwala and thence towards talwandi sabo now called damdama in the patiala state halting on the way at a place called paka in talwandi sabo resided his friend dalla who asked him why he had not previously applied to him for assistance against the treacherous mohammedans he said he could have saved the guru much suffering here the guru met some sikhs who had come from lahore with a musket as an offering he asked dalla for two men to serve as targets to make trial of the weapon all who heard him thought he was insane and made no reply the guru then saw two rangahreta sikhs and invited them to submit to the trial when the guru called them they were tying on their turbans but so eager were they to please him that they went before him with their turbans only half bound and vied with each other as to who should first be the subject of his experiment the guru said he only wanted one of them and further explained that he merely desired to prove the cowardice and disloyalty of dallas soldiers and show that had they been with him in anandpur they would have deserted him in the hour of danger the guru's wives mata sundari and sahib kaur here joined him in his wanderings they wept copiously on hearing the fate of the young children the guru endeavoured to console them and said ajit singh zara war singh judge har singh and fatah singh have been sacrificed for their religion and obtained eternal life so why should the mothers of such heroes lament lo the whole world is transitory there is first childhood then youth which diminisheth day by day and at last old age when the body perisheth in the presence of god what is old age what childhood and what youth they are all the same equally of short duration the more we love our bodies the more suffering we endure love for the body is meaningless only those who apply it to good works profit by their lives your sons have gone with honour to where bliss ever abideth having performed the work of the immortal god they have now returned to him therefore accept god's will as the best and most advantageous portion instead of your sons i present you with my sikhs as a brave and worthy offspring dayal das a grandson of bahai bahagtu came from bahukcho to visit the guru the guru wished to baptize him but he refused saying he was a sikh of the ancient fashion and wished to remain so ram singh a great-grandson of bahai bahagtu came from 
Chak Bahai to invite the Guru to go and stay with him. The Guru promised that he would go some day, and requested him to hold his house in readiness to receive him. The women Bahago who remained with the Guru after the battle of Muktsar in a fit of devotional abstraction tore off her clothes and wandered half naked in the forest. The Guru restrained her, gave her the khat or Sikh drawers, and allowed her again to wear man's costume. She attained a good old age and died in Abchalanagar, Nander, revered by the Sikhs as a saint. While the Guru was in Tawandi, Wazir Khan sent a peremptory note to Dalla to surrender him, or he would dispatch an army and put them both to death. Dalla replied that the Guru was his life, and he could not part with him. If Wazir Khan sent an army, the Guru and Dalla would go into the recesses of the forest, where even if an army penetrated it would perish for want of water. In fine, Dalla manfully and courageously stated that he intended the Guru should reside with him for ever one day the guru probably not wishing to compromise his friend dalla said he would like to see the old fort of bahatinda which had been founded by binaipal he first however in pursuance of his promise went to visit ram singh at chak bahai ram singh informed dayal das of the guru's visit and suggested to him to prepare dinner for him in bahuk chaut he did so but the guru refused his hospitality and proceeded to bahagtu on his way to bahatinda the guru took up his residence on the top of the fort where now is a small temple dedicated to him at night some balaches sang of sasi and punu sasi had been brought up by a washerman punu was a balak merchant who came to the punjab with merchandise for sale he met sasi fell in love with her and remained with her until his brother came and took him forcibly away by night sasi at daybreak hearing of his abduction followed him and on arriving at a sandy desert was so overcome by the heat that she expired the poet represented that she had entered the earth in quest of punu next day the guru took occasion to expatiate on love he said men may perform devotion and penance for hundreds of thousands of years but it would be all in vain without the love of god the bairars told the guru a legend regarding the founding of bahatinda one day as binaipal was hunting he saw a wolf and a goat struggling the goat was trying to save her young from the wolf on the very spot where the struggle between the two animals took place binaipal caused the fort to be erected bairars told the guru that there was a subterranean passage between bahatinda and bahatna in bakaner the chroniclers do not state who was in possession of the fort when visited by the guru the guru thence proceeded to sama and thence returned to talwandi sabo there his friend dalla again met him dayal das had been following the guru for some time to present him with the sacred food he had prepared for him and thus secure the guru's pardon on arriving at dam dama ram singh who was in the guru's service interceded for dayal das and the guru was pleased to restore him to his friendship wazir khan sent another letter to dalla to arrest the guru or he would plunder his country and put him to death without mercy dalla replied o viceroy i fear thee not however much thou threatenest me with thine army having destroyed it the guru and i will retire into the forest where thou shalt have no power over us and whence thou shalt have to return when thy troops have perished of hunger and thirst i will by no means have the guru arrested to please thee nay i will defend him with my life zabardast khan the viceroy of lahore plundered a party of sikhs who were going to make offerings to the guru wazir khan the viceroy of sarhind plundered another party going on the same errand the guru then repeated his exhortation to his sikhs to wear arms and diligently practise their use in the early days of sikhism it was different at that time the guru's teaching was to remember the true name and not annoy anybody farid said if any one strike thee with his fist strike him not back with such teaching the guru said the sikhs had become faint-hearted and ever suffered defeat now that the times had altered and the sikhs were obliged to defend themselves he had established the khalsa and whoever desired to abide in it should not fear the clash of arms but be ever ready for the combat and the defence of his faith at the same time the name was still to remain the chief object of the sikh's adoration
end of chapter 27section twenty eight of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty eight while the guru was at dam dama he dictated the whole of the granth sahib to bhai mani singh and added for the first time the hymns and sloks of his father guru teg bahadur with a slock of his own it is said that the guru used to have baptismal water prepared and thrown among the bushes he explained that he did so in order that the malwa sikhs might increase in number and spring from every forest shrub he used also to have pens made and scattered in different directions by this he meant that the inhabitants of the place should become learned and expert penmen the guru while at damdama used in the afternoon to go into the forest and sit under a john tree the place was hence called john Diana. a temple was subsequently erected there at night the guru used to return to damdama it was while in this neighbourhood he baptized dalla and one hundred other sikhs the guru sent for tilak singh and ram singh who had performed the obsequies of his two sons ajit singh and zorawar singh fallen at chamkaur they came to visit him and made him large offerings the guru was well pleased with them and blessed them and their offspring it may be here mentioned that ram singh is the ancestor of the chief of patiala and tilak singh the ancestor of the chiefs of naba and jind one day the guru said to dalla that is a fine field of wheat i see dalla replied that is grass o true guru wheat groweth not here had we wheat the muhammadans would oppress us say that moth and bajra are growing here another day the guru said o dalla i see excellent sugar-cane here dalla made the same reply as before when the guru said he had seen wheat the guru said thou knowest not thine advantage i desire to make thy land as fertile as sarhind the turks whom thou fearest shall soon perish and the soil of malwa in time bear wheat and sugar-cane this prophecy has been fulfilled canals made by the british government have since fertilized that part of the country it was here the guru heard that kapura had been put to death by isa khan of kot isa khan in the firozpur district the cause and manner of his death were as follows call a descendant of prithi chand had established a religious fair at dilwan kapur attended it and became involved in a drunken brawl with some of the pilgrims call sent a great-grandson of his to interpose but the youth was killed another great-grandson whom he dispatched on a similar errand met with the same fate on this abhai ram the father of the youths slain became furious with kapura desired that the guru's curse on him might speedily take effect and his line be extirpated isa khan with all haste employed a party of men to attack kapura whom he suspected to be a friend of the guru the latter tried to defend himself but was worsted and then tried to conceal himself in a haystack isa khan dragged him forth and made him a prisoner when taking him away he thought he would be only an encumbrance so he ordered him to be hanged on the nearest tree kapura himself remembered the guru's curse that his head should be put into a bag of ashes so he requested it should be done before his execution that the words of the guru might be fulfilled and that he might be thus saved from further transmigration on one occasion a question arose as to what the earth rested on the theories of the hindus and other sects were put forward the guru concluded the discussion by saying that the earth was supported by the power of god who alone was true and permanent he on that occasion repeated the sixteenth pari of the japji daya singh and dharm singh whom the guru had sent with the zafarnama to the emperor succeeded in delivering it and were furnished with a parwana of safe conduct for their return journey the perusal of the zafarnama is said to have softened the emperor's heart 
and led him to repent hence his permission to the guru's messengers to return to their own country in peace and safety they however received no verbal or written reply to the guru's letter the guru asked dalla to accompany him to the south of india dalla replied that he considered his humble couch at damdama was equal to the throne of dili and he pressed the guru and his sikhs to remain with him the bairars in the guru's service also endeavoured to dissuade him from his contemplated journey he refused to listen to them and on this several of them left his service the guru was now left with only dalla singh the two great grandsons of bhai bhagtu namely ram singh and his brother fatah singh param singh and dharm singh descendants of bhai rupa and bhai mani singh the sikh biographer and arranger of the odd granth and the tenth guru's granth their first march was to kawal thence to jowar thence to janda and thence to sarsa param singh and dharm singh had a new bed provided for the guru at every march dalla singh to every one's intense amazement absconded during the march in the dead of night and took with him a sodhi and several bairars the guru dismissed fatah singh on ram singh's representation that his services and assistance were required at home the guru thence proceeded to narhar a town of bikanar about twenty miles southwest of sarsa though the inhabitants were very rich they do not appear to have been forward in providing supplies for the guru and his few remaining followers on the contrary there was great commotion in the town because one of his sikhs had accidentally killed a pigeon when the guru went into the market-place he saw that the inhabitants were very proud of their wealth and he foretold that it should all soon vanish in a d seventeen hundred and fifty six a sikh expedition was directed against charupur chainpura but on finding the water on the march brackish the soldiers made a diversion and plundered nahar thence the guru proceeded to bahaduran there he gave param singh and dharm singh a horse each and also arms for their defence on arriving at sahua sayo the guru noticed that through respect for him they were taking the arms on their heads and walking beside their chargers as being a guru's gifts the guru said that they should obtain whatever they required and that their tongues should be to them as arms on bidding them farewell he presented them with a religious work containing the morning and evening divine services of the sikhs the guru's next march was to madhu singhana he thence proceeded to pushkar a place of pilgrimage sacred to brahma a brahmin called chetan showed the guru the sacred places of ajmer the guru while in that neighbourhood was often severely heckled on the subject of his dress people said it was neither hindu nor mohammedan the guru admitted the fact and said it was the dress of the third distinct sect which he had established thence the guru proceeded to narainpur generally known as dadu dawara where the saint dadu had lived and flourished his shrine had by this time descended to a mahant called jait who quoted two lines of dadu to the guru dadu surrender thy claim to every worldly thing pass thy days without claims how many have departed after trading in this grocer's shop the guru said these lines were applicable to the invention of a religion but ill suited to its preservation rather should the lines be read asserting thy claim in the world plunder the wicked extirpate him who doeth thee evil the mahant quoted two other lines to the guru dadu taking the times as they come be satisfied with this call age if any one throw a clod or a brick at thee lift it on thy head the guru would not admit the line and altered it thus if any one throw a clod or a brick at thee angrily strike him with a stone the guru then explained the principles of his own religion to the mahant this age is very evil the wicked rule in it and cause suffering to saints and holy men tyrants therefore deserve to be punished they will not refrain as long as they are pardoned o mahant they who bear arms who remember the true name and sacrifice their lives for their faith shall go straight to paradise therefore i have established the khalsa religion given my followers arms and made them heroes the guru was censured by his staff for lifting his arrow in salutation of dadu's shrine 
man singh quoted the guru's own written instructions gor marhi mat bul na mane worship not even by mistake muhammadan or hindu cemeteries or places of cremation the guru explained that he saluted the shrine to test his sikhs devotion and their recollection of his instructions the guru however admitted that he had technically rendered himself liable to a fine and cheerfully paid one hundred and twenty-five rupees the guru thence went to lali thence to magharada and thence to kulait here he met daya singh and dharm singh returning from their embassy to aurangzeb it is probable the embassy reached the emperor when he was ill the envoys told the guru that when they left the emperor's court they heard he had been seized with a colic the guru thence proceeded to baghaur here he heard of aurangzeb's death and the accession of his second son tar azim called muhammad azim shah by muhammadan historians the inhabitants of baghaur refused supplies and quarrelled with the guru's escort a camel belonging to the guru trespassed on one of the town gardens the gardeners beat the camel and abused the camel driver upon this the sikhs went in a body and assaulted the gardeners this led to a counter-assault and fighting which lasted two days by this time the sikhs had stormed and plundered the city but the fort remained to be captured by the advice of ratan singh a sikh whom the guru must have met on his travels a cannon was placed on a hill commanding the fort after a brief cannonade the occupants held out a flag of truce peace was proclaimed but on the arrival of the raja of the place who had been absent when the fighting began hostilities were resumed dharm singh killed the raja's commander-in-chief and the guru killed the raja himself the bag our army then fled and was pursued by the sikhs until the guru recalled them upon this the guru resumed his march on setting out he told the sikhs that the turks should soon fight against one another and that the usurper tara azim should be killed End of chapter twenty eight section twenty nine of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty nine when aurangzeb died his eldest son bahadur shah was engaged in a military expedition in afghanistan when his younger brother tara azim usurped the throne bahadur shah hastened back to india to claim and do battle for his heritage he consulted nand lal a friend of his as to how he should be successful nand lal advised him to seek the guru's assistance the guru on being appealed to promised him not only assistance but sovereignty if he agreed to a request he was about to make and did not prove false like his father bahadur shah was pleased to accept these vague conditions and informed the guru accordingly the guru sent dharm singh with some trusty sikhs to render him all possible assistance and feeling anxiety regarding the grave political circumstances of the country deemed it advisable to retrace his steps to the north in hope of meeting and conferring with the emperor when bahadur shah had fully equipped his army he marched to agra tara azim who was at the time in distant ahmad nagar on hearing of his brother's operations marched by gualiar to contend with him for empire bahadur shah advanced to meet him and encamped at jaju near dalpur dolpur where the opposing armies met after a fight of three days duration not only tara azim but several of his principal officers were slain upon this his army fled and victory remained with bahadur shah he now undisputed monarch of india returned to agra and dispatched dharm singh to inform the guru of his victory on the guru's arrival in dihli he encamped on the left bank of the jamna his sikhs thought it unsafe for him to enter that strong mohammedan and imperial centre he erected a temple on the spot where his father guru teg bahadur had been cremated 
on hearing of bahadur shah's victory the guru resolved to go to agra to congratulate him and made arrangements to leave his wives in dihli under the protection of his sikhs upon hearing this mata sundari wept copiously the guru consoled her with the arguments and reflections he had previously employed at damdama on the transitoriness of human life and the bliss in which her son abode as a mighty hero and religious martyr a goldsmith residing in dihli came to the guru to pray him to grant him the favour of a son one day as the guru went to the chase accompanied among others by the goldsmith they saw a woman abandon her male infant in the forest the guru told the goldsmith to take and rear the child the goldsmith said he could not afford a wet nurse the guru directed him to take some water recite wa guru over it and wash his wife's breast therewith when she took the child in her lap milk would at once come in abundance the goldsmith accepted the guru's advice and the promised result was obtained when the child was five years of age he was seen by mata sundari who found in him a marvellous likeness to her martyred son and duly adopted him sahib kaur importuned the guru to allow her to accompany him at last he yielded to her entreaties bahadur shah sent a messenger to the guru to expedite his departure the messenger informed him that the emperor feared the bigotry of his co-religionists were he himself to pay the first visit the guru on the third day after his departure from dihli arrived at matura and encamped at saraj kund on the banks of the jamna he made a tour through bindraban and visited all its famous and interesting places on his journey to agra the guru wanted water one of his sikhs fetched it from the house of a barren woman of the priestly class and told the guru that there being no children there the water must be pure the guru would not admit that children defiled water and asked it to be brought him from some house where there were sons and daughters on that occasion he said a hermit is best when alone pure is his body and pure his mind but where there is a householder with a large family the house is still purer and so are his body mind and understanding the guru duly met the emperor bahadur shah in agra the emperor thanked him for such assistance as he had given him in obtaining the throne made him costly presents and invited him to spend some time with him the guru was pleased to accept the invitation one day as the guru and a high officer were seated together a sayid of sarhind asked the guru if he could perform a miracle the guru replied that miracles were in the power of the emperor he could raise a humble person to the highest office and dignity or degrade him therefrom the sayid said he knew that but had the guru himself the power of working any miracles upon this the guru drew forth a gold coin and said that it was a miracle for everything could be purchased with it the sayid asked if he could show any further miracles in reply the guru drew his sword and said that that also was a miracle it could cut off heads and confer thrones and empires upon those who wielded it with dexterity upon this the sayid hung down his head and asked no further questions some rajas of rajputana came to visit the guru he told them they did one very regrettable thing namely they gave their daughters in marriage to mohammedan emperors and princes he made them swear that they would for the future desist from the practice one day in conversation with the guru the emperor maintained that if any one were to repeat the mohammedan creed he should not be consigned to hell the guru denied that the creed had that efficacy if any one after repeating it were to do evil the repetition of the creed would not avail him the emperor asked how he was to be assured of that the guru replied the creed is stamped on thy rupee we shall see the effect thereof the guru secretly sent a bad rupee to the market-place to be changed the money-changer applied to at once rejected it as counterfeit it was then taken to the other money-changers with the same result the guru then addressed the emperor see in thine empire even in thine own market-place no one hath paid any regard to thy creed engraved on this rupee so how shall it conduct men to heaven thou to-day enjoyest empire and canst do what thou pleasest 
if here in thy presence this bad rupee even with the creed on it cannot pass how can it be accepted by another monarch in god's court gilding availeth not the counterfeit and the genuine are there distinguished and men obtain the reward or punishment due to their acts thy creed therefore as in the present case cannot avail thee for admission into heaven without good works when all accounts are called for by the great examiner it is only those who show balances to their credit who shall be delivered the guru and the emperor's conversation turned on the subject of hindu pilgrimages the guru said he himself had no concern with them next day when he visited the emperor the latter said there were two ways the hindu and the mussulman in the world and inquired which the guru preferred to follow the guru said he was well disposed towards both and he instructed every one as he found him the emperor replied there is one god and one faith on what dost thou rely the guru smiled and said my brother there are three gods the emperor inquired where that was written and added a child born yesterday knoweth there is only one god the guru continued why did thine ancestors hinder the hindus from worshipping ram narayan and tell them they must only utter mala pak or kuda thou proclaimest that heaven is made for moslems and hell for the hindus hindus will not associate with any one who adoreth mala pak or kuda such is the quarrel between the two sects know that my religion is that regarding which there is no controversy the hindus have a god whom moslems do not acknowledge and i have a god whom neither of them acknowledge the emperor one day preached the guru a sermon against hindu superstitions the guru agreed with him but at the same time would not flatter the mohammedan religion he said that as the hindu worshipped stones so did the mohammedans worship departed saints and even a black lifeless slab at maka and as the hindus when at prayer turned their faces to the east the mohammedans turned their faces to the west the mohammedans supposed that their prophet could mediate for them but he had become ashes and what advantage could his ashes or those of his saints confer on men the guru thus found fault with both the hindu and mohammedan religions and said that he had struck out a religion of his own the basis of which was the worship of the sole immortal god some discussion arose on the subject of the guru's discourse but he promptly answered all objections the guru now explicitly stated the request he had several times hinted that he desired to make it was to deliver up to him wazir khan who had killed his children at sarhind the emperor naturally desired to know what the guru proposed to do with him the guru candidly replied that he would have life for life according to the law of retaliation contained in the emperor's sacred book the emperor shuddered on hearing this request but gave no direct refusal he said he would reply after consulting his ministers at the same time he felt that if he surrendered a viceroy to the guru a popular rebellion and a mutiny of his mohammedan army would be the result the emperor therefore requested the guru to wait for a year until his rule was more firmly established and then he would consider the request made the guru on this reproached the emperor with falsehood and said that a sikh should arise who should call the false and counterfeit to account who should seize and kill the emperor's viceroys priests and magistrates and contribute to the ruin of the mughal empire notwithstanding this blunt language and undisguised menace the emperor invited the guru to go with him on a visit to jaipur and other cities the guru promised to join him on the march after a few days he set out and overtook the emperor they both visited jodhpur and jitaur each raja sent his envoy to conciliate and do homage to the guru at chitaur there arose a quarrel between the sikhs and the rajputs on account of some grass the former had taken for their horses the guru censured his sikhs and ordered them to take nothing for the future without payment the emperor and the guru continued their journey to the narbada river the quarrel between the sikhs and the mohammedans was kept alive by the emperor's escort many of whom were relations of the imperial soldiers slain by the sikhs at anandpur the guru sent man singh one of his five beloved to adjust the difference between both parties while on his mission of peace the brave man singh one of the surviving heroes of chamkaur who had never parted from the guru was assassinated by a fanatic the emperor was much distressed on hearing of his death and ordered that his murderer should be seized 
and given up to the guru for punishment the guru pardoned him and thus gained great praise from the muhammadans for his mercy and clemency the emperor and the guru continued their march to burhanpur on the tapti river the inhabitants had prepared a house there for the guru where he passed some time a holy man came to visit him and said o guru i was present with thy father on the bank of the brahmaputra when thou wert born in patna he said that thou shouldst afterwards travel to the south of india the prophecy having now been fulfilled i have come to meet and welcome thee he then gave the guru hospitable entertainment the emperor continued his journey and left the guru at burhanpur after some days the emperor wrote to him to join him and he acceded to his request both then proceeded to pune and thence to nander on the margin of the river godavari in the present state of hyderabad and about one hundred and fifty miles northwest of its capital End of life of guru gobind singh chapter twenty nine section thirty of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty the original name of nander was now nandera because it is said that nine rikis dwelt there in prehistoric times it is supposed to occupy the site of the ancient city of tagara described by the author of the periplus of the erythrean sea in the middle of the fourth century it was still a place of importance and the capital of a petty kingdom its fortifications have long since been dismantled or have perished by lapse of time and there is now no trace of any ancient building save a few old temple pillars preserved in a small mosque near the court of the sub-collector the country is diversified by dale and hillock along the lazily flowing godavari the guru arrived in nander in sawan july august a d seventeen hundred and seven with some infantry and two or three hundred cavalry equipped with lances he went to the hut of madho das a baragi hermit finding the baragi absent and hearing that he possessed such skill and magic that he could overthrow any one who sat on his couch the guru proceeded to sit thereon and make himself at home he shot one of the baragi's goats and cooked and ate the flesh a disciple went to inform the baragi of the guru's proceedings it was a sacrilege to kill an animal at the baragi's seat and another sacrilege to take possession of the couch which served him as a throne he came to demand an explanation of the intruder's strange conduct the baragi represented that the place had been first his guru's seat then his own and he did not desire to have it usurped by an unknown stranger who moreover committed violence and sacrilege the guru replied that he had arrived fatigued in nander and having heard of the baragi's hospitality and philanthropy took the liberty of testing the favourable accounts he had received the bairagi accepted the guru's explanation recognized from his words and manner that he was a great man and called himself his banda slave the name by which he was subsequently known banda whose original name was lachmandev was son of ramdev rajput and native of rajari in the himalayan state of punch before he adopted a religious role he had been a zamindar or cultivator in early years he practised the use of firearms and was devoted to the chase once when he shot a female deer he found two young ones in her womb he was so distressed at what he had done that he decided to renounce the world and became a disciple of a fakir named janki prasad as a wandering mendicant he made his way to the source of the godavari at nasik he there made himself a hut and began to perform austerities a yogi called luni visited him and instructed him in the science of yog and incantations being thus accomplished he set out again on his travels and followed the source of the godavari until he arrived in nander there he became known as a holy man in possession of many charms for the acquisition of spiritual and temporal advantages he used to pray and perform penance on a little mound overlooking the godavari 
and thence at intervals watch its slow and dreamy motion as if it were loath to lose itself in the open sea the guru was pleased with the position and seclusion of nander and decided to make it his permanent abode he used to sit in prayer and meditation on a small stone structure on the margin of the river near it is a little larger building where the granth sahib was read it is now and has been for years in a state of dilapidation the guru instructed banda in the tenets of his religion and in due time baptized him according to the new rites on that occasion banda received the name gurbakhsh singh but continued to be known as banda he conceived a great affection for the true religious guide he had at last found and one day asked him if there were any service he could perform for him the guru after reflection found that he had an account to settle with the muhammadans of the punjab and replied i have come into the world to consolidate the faith and destroy oppressors art thou prepared to assist me banda promised to undertake any enterprise suggested by the guru upon this he was enjoined to proceed to the punjab and wreak vengeance on the enemies of the khalsa thou hast called thyself my slave said the guru but thou shalt be the most exalted of all saying this the guru presented him with five arrows and thus addressed him as long as thou remainest continent thy glory shall increase he who is continent turneth not away from the combat and his opponents cannot withstand him the continent man succeedeth in everything once thou forsakest the khalsa principles and associatest unlawfully with woman thy courage shall depart he then ordered banda to proceed towards the jamna wait at a little distance from Buria for reinforcements which he would cause to be sent him then go to sadhara Buria and sadhara are both in the present district of ambala and plunder and devastate it the reason was that the muhammadans of the place had caused budu shah and his disciples to be executed by the emperor for the offence of having assisted the guru at the battle of bangani when banda had disposed of the guru's enemies at sandhara he was to proceed to sack some more muhammadan cities then march to sarhind and put its governor wazir khan to death the guru gave him instructions to cut off wazir khan's head with his own hands and not entrust this pious duty to any subordinate this done banda was commissioned to go to the hills and search for the hill rajas who had so often and so cruelly persecuted the guru and mete out to them the same justice as to the mughal enemies of the khalsa with banda the guru dispatched baba binod singh his son baba khan singh descendants of guru angad and baz singh a descendant of guru amar das who were all three to give banda further instructions in the new religion he had adopted with these the guru sent five other sikhs to assist in the enterprise and support the martial fame of the khalsa after banda's departure the guru lived at various places in the immediate neighbourhood at the shikar ghat or game ferry whence he used to go hunting at the nagina ghat where a sikh presented him with a valuable signet ring which he flung into the river at the hira ghat where he disposed in a similar manner of a valuable diamond ring presented him by the emperor while in nander and at the spot now called the sagat sahib where he used to give religious instruction to his followers and expound to them the granth sahib while at the sangat sahib a multani sikh brought the guru an offering of a bow and two arrows he was much pleased and put the bow to the test by discharging one of the arrows from it he sent one of his followers to inquire where the arrow had fallen on being informed of the spot he said that was where he wished to reside the muhammadans objected but their objection was overruled by the emperor who made the guru a present of the land he went and abode there and made it the scene of his propaganda it is the place on which his shrine was subsequently erected after some time a pathan one day came and claimed from the guru a sum of eleven thousand rupees as the price of horses he had supplied him the guru had not sufficient funds to discharge the debt he said that thirty years after his decease the sikhs should be in power and the pathan had only to present the guru's acknowledgment of the debt to their leaders when he should receive the amount many hundredfold the debt was duly discharged by the sikhs under happier and more prosperous circumstances End of chapter thirty
section thirty one of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain life of guru gobind singh chapter thirty one the guru feeling that his end was approaching desired to send sahib kaur to her co-wife sundari whom he had left in dili on his departure to the south of india he knew that she could not endure the shock which his demise would cause her she at first refused to leave nander saying that she had made a vow never to take her daily food without seeing the guru and how could she fulfil her vow if she were to part from him the guru then gave her six weapons which had belonged to his grandfather guru har gobind and told her to look at them whenever she desired to behold him with these and other inducements he at last persuaded her to depart she was accompanied by bai mani singh and both were enjoined to comfort and console sundari the current sikh account of the guru's death is that he was stabbed by gul khan a grandson of painda khan in revenge for the death of the latter at the hands of guru har gobind more probable is the account given in one of the recensions of bahadur shah's history the guru was in the habit of constantly addressing assemblies of worldly persons religious fanatics and indeed all varieties of people one day an afghan who frequently attended these meetings was sitting listening to him when certain expressions which were disagreeable to the ears of the faithful fell from the guru's tongue the afghan was enraged and regardless of the guru's dignity and importance stabbed him twice or thrice with a poniard the emperor on hearing of the outrage dispatched some of his most skilful surgeons to attend to the guru's injuries and so skilfully did they perform their duty that the guru's wounds were nearly healed in a fortnight after which the surgeons took their leave as being no longer required in a short time the emperor again sent to inquire after the guru's health and made him several offerings which included two bows a discussion arose whether the guru could bend them on this he took up one and on bending it burst open his imperfectly healed wounds blood began to flow copiously the wound was bound up by the guru's attendants but this time it was past medicament the guru set apart five hundred rupees for the preparation and distribution of sacred food and one hundred rupees to purchase sandalwood and whatever else was necessary for his obsequies his sikhs came to him and said that while he was alive they had the benefit of his presence but they required instruction which might remind them of him hereafter and guide them to salvation the guru replied o oh, dear and beloved khalsa the immortal gods will can never be resisted he who is born must assuredly die guru arjan hath said everything we behold shall perish night and day are merely expressions of time it is the immortal god alone who ever abideth all other beings however holy and exalted must depart when the last moment allotted them arriveth for none can escape the primordial law of corporeal dissolution all this world composed of the five elements is death's prey when the materials perish how can the fabric remain god the creator and cherisher of all is alone immortal brahma vishnu shiv and the other gods of the hindus perished at their appointed time of what account is man wherefore o oh my friends it is not good to be unduly enamoured of this fragile body know that the light of the imperishable god whose attributes are permanence consciousness and happiness shineth ever in you wherefore always abide in cheerfulness and never give way to mourning god is ever the same he is neither young nor old he is not born neither doth he die he feeleth not pain or poverty know that the true guru abideth as he creatures who are steeped in bodily pride are very unhappy and night and day subject to love and hate ever entangled and involved in the deadly sins they perish by mutual enmity and at last find their abode in hell yet for the love of such creatures the guru assumed birth to deliver them 
he hath instructed them in the true name and very fortunate are they who have received and treasured his instruction by it they are enabled to save themselves and others from the perils of the world's ocean as when after drought rain falleth and there is abundance so the guru seeing human beings suffering and yearning for happiness came to bestow it on them and remove their sorrows by his teaching and as the rain remaineth where it falleth so the guru's instruction ever abideth with his disciples the sikhs who love the true guru are in turn beloved by him o khalsa remember the true name the guru hath arrayed you in arms to procure you the sovereignty of the earth those who have died in battle have gone to an abode of bliss i have attached you to the skirt of the immortal god and entrusted you to him read the granth sahib or listen to it so shall your minds receive consolation and you shall undoubtedly obtain an abode in the guru's heaven they who remember the true name render their lives profitable and when they depart enter the mansions of eternal happiness when the sikhs came again to take their last farewell of the guru they inquired who was to succeed him he replied i have entrusted you to the immortal god ever remain under his protection and trust to none besides wherever there are five sikhs assembled who abide by the guru's teachings know that i am in the midst of them he who serveth them shall obtain the reward thereof the fulfilment of all his heart's desires read the history of your gurus from the time of guru nanak henceforth the guru shall be the khalsa and the khalsa the guru i have infused my mental and bodily spirit into the granth sahib and the khalsa after this the guru bathed and changed his dress he then read the japji and repeated an ardus or supplication while doing so he gave instructions that no clothes should be bestowed as alms in his name he then put on a muslin waistband slung his his bow over his shoulder and took his musket in his hand he opened the granth sahib and placing five pais and a cocoa nut before it solemnly bowed to it as his successor then uttering wa guru ji ka khalsa wa guru ji ki fata he circumambulated the sacred volume and said o beloved khalsa let him who desireth to behold me behold the guru granth obey the granth sahib it is the visible body of the guru and let him who desireth to meet me diligently search its hymns the guru went to an enclosure formed of tent walls where his bier had been erected in the end of the night a watch before day he lay on his bier and directed all his sikhs except by santok singh who was specially attached to him to go to their homes he then gave his last orders to his last attendant keep my kitchen ever open and receive offerings for its maintenance if any one erect a shrine in my honour his offspring shall perish by santok singh represented that the sikhs were few at nander and how were offerings to be obtained the guru replied o bai santok singh have patience singhs of mine of very great eminence shall come here and make copious offerings everything shall be obtained by the favour of guru nanak he then in grateful acknowledgment of the spiritual benefactions of the founder of his religion uttered a persian distich the translation of which is gobind singh obtained from guru nanak hospitality the sword victory and prompt assistance the guru then breathed his last the sikhs made preparations for his obsequies as he had instructed them the sohila was solemnly chanted and sacred food distributed while all were mourning the loss of the guru a hermit arrived and said you suppose that the guru is dead i saw him this very morning riding his bay horse when i bowed to him he said come o hermit let me behold thee very happy am i that i have met thee at the last moment i then asked him whither he was wending his way he smiled and said he was going to the forest on a hunting excursion he had his bow in his hand and his arrows were fastened with a strap to his waist the sikhs who heard this statement arrived at the conclusion that it was all the guru's play that he dwelt in uninterrupted bliss and that he showed himself wherever he was remembered he had merely come into the world they said to make trial of their faith and remove the ills of existence wherefore for such a guru who had departed bodily to heaven there ought to be no mourning the ashes of his bier were collected and a platform built over them the khalsa to whom the guruship had been entrusted 
declared that all those who visited the spot should receive due spiritual reward the guru departed from the scene of his earthly triumphs and reverses on thursday the fifth day of the bright half of kartik sambat seventeen hundred and sixty five a d seventeen hundred and eight having exercised spiritual and temporal sovereignty over the sikhs for three and thirty years and resided in nander for fourteen months and ten days the sikh temple at nander called ab chal nagar is an imposing structure with a cupola and two minarets the interior is surrounded by a wall of martial implements emblematic of the militant side of the guru's character it was built by maharaja ranjit singh in eighteen hundred and thirty two in defiance of the guru's interdiction additions are being continually made to the edifice by the contributions of devout sikhs End of chapter thirty one